All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the webinar series, Natural Resource Policy, Culture, and Law. Before we start, we would like to recognize that as a land-grant institution, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrieleno Tongva peoples as the traditional caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin, and Southern Channel Islands. This symposium will examine issues involving the land and water governance and the relationships among minority and indigenous groups, their traditional lands, natural resource management, and the larger society. As indigenous minority and cultural rights have become increasingly important as an element of human rights, historical justice and reconciliation, the governance and forms of indigenous lands tenure in various states around the Asia Pacific have become a particularly salient issue. International instruments such as Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and Article 27 of International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights have extended the right of culture to include rights to land. The Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples makes this right explicit and the state parties to the declaration have committed themselves to give legal recognition and protection to indigenous lands and territories, as well as associated resources. You can read more about the full symposium on our website, dal.ucla.edu slash engage research slash webinars. We also have a Facebook engage research in the Asia Pacific that you can check us out on. This symposium builds um, part of the 2020 series, uh, 10 part webinar series, Indigenous Peoples, Heritage and Landscape in the Asia Pacific, undertaken by the Science and Technology Innovation Center for Taiwan, Philippines, Indigenous Knowledge, Local Knowledge and Sustainable Studies or CDPILS, National Changchi University, Taiwan, the, the UCLA Department of Anthropology in the US, UCLA Center for Southeast Asian Studies, UCLA Asia Pacific Center, University of New England First Peoples Rights and Law Center in Australia, the Auckland University of Technology Center for Indigenous Rights and Law. We have also added the University of Toyama in Toyama, Japan as a partner this year. The website for the symposium is Engaged Scholarship in the Asia Pacific Community Engaged Research. For our attendees um, in this first session of our webinar series, you are invited to use the Q&A feature to ask your questions, and we will have some time to address them at the end of the webinar. I'd like to now introduce our panelists. First will be from the University of New England Law School, Marcel Burns, along with Sean Hooper from University of New England Aboriginal Land and Sea Hub. For our second presentation, we have Maurice Stewart, Stryker Fellow at Harvard Medical School, and our third presentation will be from Brian McGinnis, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Our moderator today is Professor Dawei Kwan from National Changchi University. At this time, I would like to invite Joe Fraser from University of New England to um, speak and take the floor and give us a welcome. Joe Fraser, Western Australia. Uh, Ngaulu Wiltshire, Armadale, New South Wales in Australia. So hi everybody, uh, I'm Joe Fraser and I'm from Iramagaru. I was born in Iramagaru, Robin in Western Australia. Um, my early years were spent in the country where my grandmother was born in the Northern Territory of Australia. Uh, since then I've lived across Australia and Hawaii Ne, and my background is uh, adult education uh, today, I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Indigenous Strategy at the University of New England in Australia. It's wonderful to be here today, and thanks to everyone for this opportunity to do the Acknowledgement of Country. Uh, the topic that is being addressed today is an important one, considering the role that country plays or land plays in people's economic, spiritual and existential being. Uh, the issues relating to land and water governance, the relationships among minority and indigenous, indigenous groups, uh, their traditional lands, natural resource management, and the larger society are complex, as is the brief in your webinar. But it's also so important towards our future and our identity. Australia's had a, a lot of legal conflict 
to, uh, across time around this topic. Um, a few examples going back decades, uh, the, the Pilbara's workers' strikes by people like Dooley Binbin, and Clancy McKenna, Kanga Shot in the 1940s, uh, the Yurikala, uh, Yurikala Bark petition in the 1960s with the Yongo clans, the Wavehill walk off with the Gurindji, um, the Mabo decision in 1992, the WIC decisions in 1996 um, for the Mur and the WIC Theore peoples, uh, as well as uh, Ngaliwuru and Ngangali peoples of Timber Creek and, and their issues in 2019 are all, all examples of some of the conflict around the, the use of, of land and country for Indigenous peoples in Australia. Where there's been some legal successes, it's interesting to note that um, a, a key discussion uh, in the Yirrkala Bark petition is to note that Justice Blackburn ruled against the Yolnu at Yirrkala, stating that while they belonged to the land, they didn't own it. Um, however, perhaps a good outcome from that situation, particularly could have been the development of the land rights acts that followed in the mid 70s. Mm -hmm. um, today, we see our relationships to the land through language and ancestral knowledge, such as Native Hawaiian Olelo no Iao. So for example, He Ali'i Ka'aina He Kawake Kanaka says that the land is the chief and we are the servants. Um, Australian kinship systems link us specifically to individual pieces of land and provide connection uh, metaphysically and spiritually. Uh, many Indigenous groups still use ancestral knowledges and practices for gathering, connecting, caring, respecting and belonging to country. And I expect this will continue for a long time. Today, uh, I'm on Anaiwan lands and I'd like to acknowledge the lands that you all belong to and are on today and the custodians of those places. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge our elders and I hope our ancestral wisdom and traditional knowledge serves us all well today. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that message. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone once again that questions can be asked using the Q&A feature through Zoom and we will address them at the end of our three presentations. And with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to our moderator, Professor Dawei Kwan. Thank you, Mehdi. And good morning from Taiwan. Uh, I'm Dawei Kwan Daya uh, from the indigenous community of Dayan in, 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 in the mountain uh, area of North Taiwan. And it's great honor to be here uh, as a moderator in this uh, panel. And as Mehdi also pointed out uh, earlier, the season, the title of this season is Traditional Knowledge, Law and Land Use, land use Management. And our first uh, presenter uh, is Marcel Burns and the co-author uh, is Sean Hooper. Um, Marcel Burns is the Gome Roy Kami La Roy First Nation from the uh, First Nation and of Gome Roy Kami La Roy. And uh, she is the lecturer at the School of Law, Uni University of New England. She has over 20 years uh, experience in the field of indigenous peoples and law, working as both as a lawyer and academic. And Sean Hooper is the lead researcher uh, in the University of New England Land and Sea Hub. Uh, he completes the master by research looking at how Aboriginal cultural knowledge and practice inform cultural burning and how this related to the concept of an Aboriginal philosophy. So uh, today, um, Marcel will uh, share us their presentation of the um, the of their research, uh, which is the cultural burning and resource management. So this will come, Marcel. Thank you, Dawei. I'll just say that um, Sean's going to go first. He's going to talk about cultural burning, and then I'll talk about some of the legal issues around that. Thank you. Very short. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share the, oops, started at the, the wrong end of the uh, thing. Um, I'll um, uh, yammer everybody. Um, I hope that everyone is traveling well. Um, I just wanted to thank Joe for his uh, welcome to country and 
um, for identifying some of the important moments in the history of uh, Aboriginal people's fight for country in, um, in Australia. Uh, my name is um, Sean Bori Hooper. I'm a Wiradjuri Balladuri man uh, from central New South Wales, which is uh, inland uh, on the east coast of uh, Australia. Um, that country was uh, grasslands all along the Macquarie River. Um, and my ancestors were quite big on sort of cultural burning, you know, to maintain those grasslands. And I've sort of continued that in my lifetime as well. And sort of hoping that my daughter will follow me and uh, continue that tradition. Um, uh, my sort of background, I've worked for National Parks and Wildlife Service and Aboriginal community groups in New South Wales and National Parks is like our um, uh, agency that manages all the uh, protected lands in New South Wales. And I've spent over 20 years sort of uh, running Aboriginal ranger teams, uh, working in joint management of national parks with the local Aboriginal communities and um, uh, looking at um, how we can bring cultural burning back into um, uh, how the national park system is managed in, um, in New South Wales. Um, and I, I've just sort of started my um, uh, PhD research looking at how story, ritual and magic sort of uh, play a role in Aboriginal land and sea management. Um, so, um, uh, I was going to talk a bit about Aboriginal cultural burning and um, try to give everyone a bit of a perspective about how, uh, what the knowledge around that looks like. And one of the things we're dealing with in, uh, in Australia at the moment is how we can protect uh, um, our traditional knowledge. Um, and uh, Marcel will sort of talk about different ways and issues that, um, you know, are faced in the legal system. Um, so, Aboriginal culture burning uh, is one of the ways that Aboriginal people maintain their connection with country. Um, it's not the only way, there's lots of different ways uh, that we do it. It's a cultural practice, um, which um, uh, is sort of different to like a body of knowledge. A, a lot of people misunderstand in a way that cultural burning is like a body of knowledge, but it's actually a cultural practice that comes from our dreaming and uh, through undertaking it, we continue uh, its renewal. Um, cultural burning is part of the broader Aboriginal cultural practice and cannot be separated from it. Um, I thought a good way to sort of illustrate how um, we understand um, the knowledge about this was to um, tell you a little story. And uh, this particular story is about um, uh, one of our ancestors called brush turkey. And uh, um, brush turkey, um, she was a bit of a, a, a jealous fella back in the, the old days. She, she was pretty plain and her feathers were plain. She didn't have a, a very good voice and she'd walk around through the bush and uh, um, look at all the other beautiful birds singing and all their beautiful feathers and everything. And the more that she walked around, the more that um, brush turkey became jealous and her jealousy grew and grew and grew to one day it just sort of overcame her and she thought, I'm gonna you know, get back at all these other beautiful birds. And um, she got some fire and threw it into the bush with the intent to kill all the birds so that she would be the most beautiful bird um, in, the, in the bush. And that fire that, um, that brush turkey started, it burnt all the way across Australia and uh, oops, back in those, uh, back in the days of brush turkey, Australia was all covered with this sort of rainforesty uh, bush all, all the way across it. And um, what um, brush turkeys fire did, it um, created all the different vegetation communities that we have. And, uh, you know, some areas that burnt quite hard and created the desert and other areas that, you know, sort of left and didn't really affect and created rainforest and uh, other areas that created our, our sort of woodlands. And uh, these sort of areas are, um, you know, what we have uh, left today and in, in modified forms, of course. Um, 
from uh, mainly from sort of uh, the effects of colonization and different land uses and um, agriculture and, and all that sort of thing. So brush turkey here, because she, you know, um, uh, did what she did, the ancestors weren't sort of um, terribly happy with her. So they um, made her, her black and gave her a red head with the yellow uh, neck to indicate fire and put her in charge of hazard reduction. And uh, to this day, brush turkey still goes around doing um, hazard reduction, you know, digging, digging in the forests and turning over the, the, the um, leaf litter and, and sort of helping to reduce the impact of fire. Um, this, oh, sorry, I'll go back the other way. So um, this, this sort of story sort of gives us a, you know, a, a good idea about um, uh, different aspects on how Aboriginal people sort of think about fire and um, Aboriginal sort of culture burning is, con is conducted in conjunction with the whole of the ecosystem and brush turkey sort of tells us that by her sort of role to, you know, do hazard reduction. Um, it is not just people doing it, but working in reciprocal relationships with all the species, beings and spirits in country. Some of these beings have specific obligations, which are set out in our dreaming stories, just as I've um, talked about with um, brush turkey here and her relationship to fire is a common story across Aboriginal communities in New South Wales. And brush turkey was very jealous of the beauty of all the other birds and her jealousy drove her to try and kill them through the setting fire on the bush. The result of this was to produce the vegetation associations that in modified forms exist today and have been part of our dreaming law. And it becomes an imperative uh, under that dreaming law for Aboriginal people through uh, Aboriginal cultural practice to maintain this. Um, in, in this particular dreaming story, the origin of the landscape is explained through brush turkey's use of wrong fire. And the consequences are explained of using wrong fire. Um, it tells us that our ancestor uh, brush turkey instantiated part of the world as we know it, and it is uh, Aboriginal people's obligation to maintain it through the maintenance of Aboriginal cultural practice of Aboriginal cultural burning. This process is essential renewal of the dreaming, which makes the dreaming, um, which has been described as the every when. Uh, uh, it is the past through the origin stories, the present through Aboriginal people's ongoing renewal and revitalization of cultural practices and ritual, such as Aboriginal cultural burning, and the future by maintenance of the relationships that provides life to continue in the beauty and variance that exists. Uh, as Aboriginal people to continue to practice Aboriginal cultural burning, it is renewed and revitalized, continuing Aboriginal cultural imperative of maintaining the dreaming. Um, the outcomes that we value today, such as protection of species and the habitats, reduction of fires, threat, maintenance of vegetation formation and climate change adaption is achieved through the constant process of revitalizing Aboriginal cultural practice and uh, uh, emerge out of that cultural practice's continuance. Um, what this sort of um, uh, does for us is um, it's sort of this interplay between um, uh, uh, Nurembung, which is our country, and uh, sort of encompasses how we're in relation to our country. And that sort of, um, you know, is connected to uh, Nyambung, which is our uh, story, country, and law. So it, as Brush Turkey here sort of um, tells us, um, you know, that sort of, um, uh, helps us understand how how we need to act in country. Um, we know what wrong fire is. We know, you know, what we need to do to maintain that through maintaining the different vegetation communities. We know that we're doing it uh, in relation with other species, and that um, the objective is life. Um, and we can sort of understand that a little bit more by looking at um, uh, this particular uh, diagram. There's over here on the side we have like the ancestors burning and this is their role in the practice of caring for our country. Um, they, they sort of burn all the dark spirit filled sacred places, whereas people have the responsibility using the fire stick to um, uh, burn other parts of country. And then there's this role for all the little furry fellas like, you know, including brush turkey and bedongs and bandicoots and all that. 
the burning that um, Aboriginal people and their ancestors do actually produce the habitat that these species depend on. And uh, they work diligently to, you know, turn over the leaf litter and reduce the fuel load in the, the bush and, um, uh, you know, assist uh, um, or sort of work with Aboriginal people and the ancestors in maintaining um, uh, the bush. And that, that sort of process is, is kind of what, um, what Aboriginal cultural burning sort of uh, looks like. And it kind of gets confusing for people because people sort of think about fire as, you know, in Australia and other places, we talk about a prescription, which is, you know, what time you're going to burn, what temperature, what weather, what wind conditions, all those sort of variables. But it's it's more, um, cultural burning is more sort of negotiated through a whole series of relationships. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that sort of functions um, as we go on. So one of the important aspects when it comes to how do we sort of protect our knowledge is understanding what Aboriginal knowledge uh, is and uh, Aboriginal knowledge sort of contains various forms of knowledge that are some are philosophical like uh, ecological um, some relate to land management practices medical uh, life knowledge ritual and spiritual knowledge um, among other sort of types um, uh, this can be in the form of empirical style knowledge knowledge in story form and all the other various sort of ways you know we maintain that knowledge um, uh, all of these uh, form sort of part of uh, uh, a process on how the, um, the knowledge that we use to manage country has emerged, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but uh, one of the important things, uh, Aboriginal people don't sort of see these as separate areas of knowledge. They're, they're um, uh, we're never sort of separated out and identified as, as um, uh, different sort of parts of knowledge. It was, you know, there was no separated between our sacred space and our sacred activities and everyday life uh, and aboriginal traditional knowledge knowledge is constantly being renewed and revitalized through a range of processes of innovation and revitalization uh, and this is a process of drawing up or emerging tradition and instantiating it within the context of um, the actualization event so cultural burning or a meeting or a ritual or ceremony and uh, um, one of the, the sort of um, uh, ways um, to sort of think about that is um, uh, what I've sort of got down here, which um, when we're um, uh, thinking about um, uh, how, you know, a, a theory of knowledge, um, a way to think about that is, is uh, how Aboriginal knowledge is emerged out of country. It is to imagine that the person is surrounded by a bubble um, and that everything else in country is sort of has its own little bubble and that contains all the information about, um, you know, your kinship, your, you know, position in the, the world and how you're sort of related to everything else. And as you sort of walk through country, these bubbles start interacting with each other and uh, people negotiate their relationship and that could be their relationship with country, a sacred site with each other with, you know, um, you know, species, uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, and and in, in this sort of particular context, um, when there needs to be a decision about what sort of, you know, how we might culturally burn or, or some other practice, Aboriginal people will come together and they'll talk about um, all of their, their experiences with country and country is always talking about what it needs and what it's doing and what its status its relational status is and um, different Aboriginal people because of their different relationships with country, you know, see different things. So people come together and um, uh, talk about that. And uh, as I say, emerge knowledge, knowledge out of country. And, and, and that emergence is possible because in uh, Aboriginal sort of perspective, uh, knowledge is pre-existing. It was put in country by the ancestors mm -hmm. and there's ways that we can sort of understand that through this sort of idea about um, uh, understanding relationships and, and how that brings knowledge um, or instantiates knowledge um, about the cosmos. And we can sort of use that to understand what we need to, to do um, in um, country. Um, 
I might hand over to um, you now, Marcel, if I'll stop sharing. Uh, Marcel, sorry, uh, I think you mute yourself. So you have- okay. okay, okay, I've unmuted. I just need to go back to full screen. Um, can you see my slides? Can you um, see my PowerPoints? Yes, not yet. You just need to full screen it. Oh. Okay, is that it? You got it now, okay, cool. All right, so I wanna um, thank Sean for providing an overview of it. Um, cultural context of the knowledge around um, cultural burning. So what I wanted to do now is just talk about some of the legal options for protection. Um, quite obviously under Aboriginal law and our own legal systems, we have a um, particular people that have responsibilities to care for country and, and that look after particular areas of knowledge. And sorry, I'll just go back one step and just introduce myself as a Gomorrah Gamilaroi woman, um, but also um, thank Joe for his acknowledgement of country today. So um, I suppose it's fair to say generally, and this is why Sean and I have been talking about this issue, is that there are no sort of robust protections for um, Indigenous knowledges um, under the, the Australian legal system. We have different influences on the Australian legal system that come from international law, but um, at present there's no um, protections that would address some of the concerns of Aboriginal people in terms of the, the broader use of knowledge around cultural burning. So we have the Convention of Biological Diversity, which is ratified by Australia in 1993, which um, has been incorporated into Australian law to a degree. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. We also have the Nagoya Protocols for um, um, sharing of benefits in relation to the use of traditional knowledges, um, which are yet to be ratified in, well, has been ratified by Australia, but hasn't been implemented into Australian law. And we also have the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which um, specifies particular rights in relation to culture, including in particular Article 31, which states that Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain, control, protect and develop their cultural heritage, traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions as well as the manifestations of their science, technologies and cultures, including human genetic resources, um, plant um, and flora and fauna, oral traditions and the like. And that um, Indigenous peoples also have the right to maintain, control, protect and develop their intellectual property over such cultural heritage, traditional knowledge and cultural expressions. Now, as it stands at, at present, um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has not been incorporated into Australian law. So it's still very much um, an aspirational document. It's non-binding in its status of international law, but does um, provide what has been described as, as the minimum standards necessary for the survival and dignity of Indigenous Peoples. Um, so, just... so, Sorry, that's uh, I'm going the wrong way. Just one moment. So, um, from international law, the way it uh, um, works in Australia, we're a dualist system where international legal instruments aren't automatically incorporated into our domestic laws unless they are specifically put into legislation by the federal government. Um, and one example of that which relates to this topic is the Convention on Biodiversity has been incorporated into Australian law to the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. And generally, in terms of the convention, what that provides for at um, Article 8J is the equitable sharing of benefits which arise from the use of the knowledge, innovations and practices of Aboriginal communities, which embody traditional lifestyles relevant for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. In the Australian context, the um, Environmental um, Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 
objects include pr um, promoting a cooperative approach to the protection and management of the environment involving governments, the community, landholders and Indigenous peoples, to recognise the role of Indigenous peoples in the conservation, ecological, sustainable use of Australia's biodiversity, and to promote the use of Indigenous peoples' knowledge and biodiversity with the involvement of and in cooperation with the owners of that knowledge. Now, even though the, um, this legislation has some very lofty objectives around um, cooperating with Aboriginal peoples in terms of the use of um, um, Indigenous knowledges, there's limited implementation of that in practice. Um, essentially what this translates to is some federal funding programs for Aboriginal ranges for people to be um, employed to work on caring for country, but there's very little um, fleshing out of the ideas around the protection of Indigenous knowledges. The other problem with the federal legislation is it's generally limited to nationally significant areas and or environments and or areas that are under Commonwealth um, control and ownership. So given that the vast majority of land in Australia is um, governed by the state or, um, or territory governments, then this um, particular legislation has little application on areas um, for example, in New South Wales, where we are situated, um, that um, are currently under Aboriginal ownership or control. So potentially the scope for the EPBC legislation to be expanded to uh, provide more rigorous protection around issues of cultural burning, but it's probably um, not the only avenue available. We also have at the federal level, the Native Title Act, which provides a process for um, transfer of lands, um, a handback of lands where um, particular Aboriginal groups can demonstrate um, traditional laws and customs, giving rise to that tenure. And, um, but it, the courts have said that the um, people, just because people are recognised as traditional owners of country, that um, the native title does not protect any form of Aboriginal knowledge um, per se, because it only deals with rights and interests in land. And I think that's a, a bit of a misunderstanding of Aboriginal people's relationships to land and, and that holistic relationship that Sean has spoken about. Looking at the um, intellectual property frameworks, we also see that they are very limited in terms of the protection of Aboriginal knowledge. Um, patents generally require a novel and inventive step to attract protection, which is not suited to traditional forms of Aboriginal knowledge that have been passed down from generation to generation or are based on um, a corpus of knowledge that in, in emerges from country in, in this sense. Um, in fact, patents in any respect also only attract a limited monopoly over the use of a particular process. So it, it doesn't protect um, Aboriginal rights to traditional knowledges in perpetuity. In intellectual property law, we've also seen some acknowledgement of collective ownership, of Aboriginal sim symbols and designs in the case of um, an, an Indofern, or commonly known as the Carpets case. But all, I think one interesting point um, Sean and I have discussed is uh, that the courts have recognised the fiduciary obligations of individual artists for the way that collective knowledge is used. So, for example, if an artist is allowed to reproduce symbols um, that are part of the collective knowledge of their um, playing group, then that artist has um, a right to um, prosecute on behalf of the collective if the use of that knowledge is um, done inappropriately or at, without permission of the artist. So there's, a, a, I suppose, a few little pockets of international, intellectual property law that could inform the way forward in terms of providing some robust protections of um, cultural burning knowledge. Um, in at the state level, in, currently in New South Wales, where we're situated, there is no legislation to protect the use of Aboriginal knowledge of cultural burning. But what we have seen over a very long time now, as far back as 1998, is calls for the introduction of sui generis legislation to cover the field in terms of the protection of Aboriginal um, cultural knowledge, but also intellectual property more broadly. So this is a call that was started um, by Terry Jenke and others 
um, the New South Wales Office of Environment in 2014 undertook a study to um, ascertain the views of some um, Aboriginal groups in New South Wales around that sort of protection and promoted um, a white paper and, and draft legislation that that has really gone nowhere. And um, I think it's, it's very important work, but looking at it and now with the benefit of hindsight, it was limited to some small groups and perhaps needs um, broader um, consultation around what that sort of legislation might look like. So I just want to finish up by sharing with you one of the observations from that um, New South Wales Office of Environment and Heritage Study, which I think also speaks to some of the issues that Sean spoke about in terms of you know, the bubbles of people that relate to a particular area of country and, and the sort of cultural, um, social and place specific nature of Indigenous knowledges. And that's something that would need to be considered in developing any legal responses to the protection of, of knowledge around cultural burning or Aboriginal knowledges more generally. So the Office of Environment and Heritage said, it is imperative that Australia's regulation of these issues properly contextualises the relationship of Aboriginal communities, their lands and resources derived from Aboriginal land and waters, knowledge pertaining to the use and management of Aboriginal resources and expressions of that knowledge, both tangible and intangible, and the cultures to which that knowledge belongs. Importantly, different communities may hold different views regarding how this knowledge may be used and protected. Um, correct identification of who entitled to speak for country is needed and understanding of what knowledge may or may not be publicly shared and under what conditions it may be shared is also important. Um, so, in concluding, we say there is definitely a need for further research in this area. Um, following the Black Summer fires, which many of you would have heard about in 2019, 2020, where large you know, millions of acres of land were devastated, over a billion um, animal species were um, wiped out. Um, there is a really strong and renewed interest in um, revitalising some of these cultural burning practices um, on the east coast of Australia. So governments are starting to move and look at this space and looking at it as um, a possible um, mitigation strategy. So we're saying if before governments sort of take over this space, we need to have some strong protections around the um, the, the use of cultural burning knowledge. And to do that, we need to find out what are the concerns at the community level in cons consultation with Aboriginal communities to engage with government and key stakeholders and to investigate some appropriate legal responses to address the concerns of Aboriginal peoples in this space. So um, that's me. Did you want to add anything to Sean? Um. Uh, I, I think one of the main things I was sort of um, trying to get across a bit was that um, Aboriginal knowledge is um, uh, sort of unique to different communities. My explanation was sort of Wiradjuri related mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's important to communities that they feel that that's protected and uh, um, uh, yeah, not having any sort of mechanism in New South Wales or Australia to do that, you know, has sort of led to the community sort of calling for um, somebody to do something about it. And uh, uh, in the past, as um, Marcel sort of talked about, New South Wales state government had a bit of a go and the federal government sort of uh, um, is trying to have a bit of a crack at it, but it's... Um, uh, not something that's sort of, you know, high on the agenda as such, but is something that definitely needs uh, uh, research and needs, um, you know, uh, building a capacity for Aboriginal uh, people within academia to actually undertake that research ourselves, um, mm -hmm. which is sort of very important. Good. Many thanks to uh, Marcel and Sean for your very inspiring uh, presentation. So I, I think uh, we are going to move to our next uh, presentation. Our uh, next presenter uh, is uh, Maurice Stott. And uh, Maurice is the uh, Tao Mori Ora company uh, from the company and also a Fulbright scholar and the Stryker fellow in the Harvard Medical uh, School. 
and she's now working with the Nobel Prize uh, laureate, Professor uh, Martia Sien, exploring the challenge to Maori economic development. Uh, in addition to her studies, she is designing and, implement, and implementing Maori economic development programs using lessons from the successful Maori response to COVID-19. And she is also a member of the National Maori Pandemic Group. And the presentation today uh, is the, to the topic of her presentation today is the de deconstructing colonial power structures to realize Maori well being. Let's welcome Maoris. Kia ora koutou nga mihi nui ki o koutou katoa. Uh, ko Maurice Kiri Stuart Tukwingwa, ko Te Ahua Hu Te Maunga, ko Māpure Te Roto, ko Waiaruhe Te Awa, ko Ngā Pohi, ko Ngā Tikahu Nunu, ko Rangi Tāne, ko Ngā Titoa, ko Ngāi Tahu Oku Iwi Ano Hoki. Uh, kia ora koutou nga mihi nui uh, ki, ki a koutou ki te ao. Um, so hello everybody, my name is Marie Stewart, I'm a medical doctor and I just um, acknowledged um, just now my mountain, Te Awahu, which is uh, not far from where I'm living right now, my lake, um, which is Lake Omapere, it is the only Māori owned lake in New Zealand, um, and Waiaruhe, my river, which was named after my direct ancestor Ruhe, uh, who's um, interestingly, his son was the first Māori hanged in New Zealand by the, by the British Crown um, back in the 1830s. So um, some interesting tidbits there, which I won't go into, but um, provides an interesting uh, foundation for my talk today. Um, and I'd just like to take this time to acknowledge all the Indigenous peoples um, in, in their respective places um, and for the, the uh, in their uh, respective uh, mana or authority over their lands and um, Tonga or resources, natural resources. I'd also just like to take this time, and I'm just going to share my slides. And hopefully that comes up properly on your screen. Um, to acknowledge the late Paul Farmer, who uh, recently departed us just a couple of days ago. I was very fortunate to be a master's student in his class at Harvard and um, it is huge sadness and I guess uh, very poignant um, his passing and that I actually uh, felt a huge ache in my stomach. I felt really confused when I heard he had passed and uh, it ignited a huge fire in me and reminded me why I went to Harvard. Um, coming back to New Zealand um, at, at the uh, start of 2020 because of the pandemic um, I was cast back into um, one of the highest deprivation area, areas in New Zealand, and it has been quite uh, difficult. Um, however, um, I think uh, uh, Paul's passing has really reminded me why I went there in the first place. I'm just going to, just lost my uh, other screen here, sorry. If I share that, I think you can see that. Just let me know if that's gone missing. So my talk today, and it is inspired by the work I've done um, with the Global Health uh, department at uh, Harvard Medical School under um, Paul Farmer's tutelage and um, called De Deconstructing Colonial Structures to Realize Māori Wellbeing. And uh, interestingly, when I was over at Harvard, I um, came across the amazing library that's there that I had a lot of uh, resources and um, some writing from our, one of our prolific um, Māori leaders um, of the 80s and 90s, Donna Awatere. And um, this quote here, which talks about the struggles that Māori have in their social circumstances, and this particularly pertaining to alcohol, um, and how that was uh, helping to deculturalize and what she called dehumanize or demana or loss of um, prestige and authority for these people. Um, and interestingly, that 
she wrote that paper in 1984 when I was born and um, it was just very poignant that I found that um, writing there uh, at the time and things haven't changed in New Zealand uh, despite um, the great PR that is put on internationally. Um, so the extent and equitable health and social circumstances experienced by Māori in New Zealand, similar to the Indigenous peoples worldwide, are a breach of the United Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Rights of Indigenous Peoples. 180 years post-colonisation, Māori own only approximately 5.6% of the original land area of New Zealand and when they were once the majority owner of that land or protector or caretaker of that land, and this is a loss of a genuine economic base for a nation of peoples who lived intrinsically with and on the land. These economic effects are concentrated in geographical areas with high proportion of Māori. And in Northland, where I live at the moment, the median income annual, annually for Māori was $19,000. And it's almost half the national average for non-Māori. Māori experience inequitable standards across all sectors of living, including, but not exclusively, employment, income, education, housing, welfare, justice, and health. And in, New in Northland, where I currently am and have ancestral connections, we have New Zealand's highest level of methamphetamine or illicit drug use in New Zealand. Um, and such accomplices to colonization, they otherwise just plague and stymie any notion of Māori flourishing. So this inequitable social circumstance demands an inquiry into the higher order social structures, which continue to drastically undermine Māori well-being in New Zealand. And that is part of the work that I'm carrying out um, with Harvard University. Um, I will now go into some of the background to the treaty claims or the, the claims um, and breach of some of the founding structures and instruments for New Zealand. So the Treaty of Waitangi claim, specifically number 2575 was lodged in 2017, which found that the Crown failed to deliver on the principles of the treaty, which include decision-making over resource allocation and system design, equitable access to services and equity of health outcomes. Um, the report on this claim examines how, despite the promise of uh, health system reforms by and by, uh, the Crown fails to properly fund the primary health sector to pursue equitable health outcomes for Māori. And they failed to target funding where it is needed the most and failing to ensure that money earmarked for Māori health issues is used for that purpose. The Tribunal also found serious treaty breaches concerning the way that the Crown holds the primary health care sector to account and reports on its performance finding that there were few mechanisms in place to ensure accountability and that those mechanisms that did exist were really used to, in relation to Māori health. The tribunal further found that the Crown fails to ensure that Māori have adequate decision-making authority and influence when it comes to the design and deliver, delivery of primary health care services. It found that the Act's provision for Māori representatives on our regional health boards do not reflect the people or the principles of partnership um, and that no other treaty consistent partnership arranges, arrangements exist within these governing boards. Furthermore, the findings were that the Crown fails to properly resource the organisations which deliver services for Māori, which is again a breach of the treaty principles. Based on the deliberations of that tr tribunal report, there is a recommendation uh, to give effect to the treaty principles and ensure that those principles are part of what guides the primary health sector and include an objective for the health sector to achieve equitable health outcomes for Māori. Um, another point um, that I must make clear is that um, the Treaty of Waitangi was signed in 1840. Where, however, prior to that, um, He Whakaputanga, or what is known as the Declaration of Independence, was signed by Northern Chiefs where I'm based here in 1835. And that document was actually a parent document which reinforced the sovereignty or the ultimate um, protection of these lands and resources for Māori. Um, and it was through um, that document um, that, that sovereignty was affirmed. Um, and most recently, although the Waitangi Tribunal, which was founded to provide advice on um, breaches of the treaty, um, they are currently undergoing investigations um, whether the Crown has continued to breach us, um, whether Māori have actually accepted a loss of sovereignty. Um, 
I'll leave that with you there and uh, go back into the health piece. In March 2020, the New Zealand Minister of Health commissioned a health system review called the Simpson Report, um, which supported the outcomes of the original Waitangi claims, indicating the requirement to implement Tetiriti principles within the New Zealand health system legislation. They also recommended the implementation of a Māori health authority, which would act as the principal advisor for Māori health and to lead the development of Māori health workforce and health service design. The Māori Health Authority is expected to monitor and report on the performance of the health and disability system as it relates to Māori and to identify issues and develop and test solutions. That same system review resulted in the introduction of the, of the Māori Health Authority and upholding the claims of Te Tiriti, New Zealand's founding document. This ongoing evidence illustrates inequitable Māori health service design and outcomes and demonstrates a lack of Māori consultation in health service design and delivery, despite the fact that we have Te Tiriti, a constitutional document which informs our uh, founding partnership with the Crown. And in the, in the Northland or Taitokido context, there's an absence of the reference to He Whakaputanga, which is the Declaration of Independence, which was signed by Northern Chiefs. Um, and in order for us to actually achieve uh, optimal health service design arrangements, the con those constitutional arrangements must be recognized. And unfortunately, as a medical doctor myself, my uh, recent interactions with the administration of this Māori Health Authority have identified significant issues um, that the same colonial motivation continues to underpin the work of the New Zealand government. Um, and I'm just um, providing here on the screen Please uh, let me know, I, I, I understand that you can see this. Um, outlining some of the statements we, um, within our sub-tribe, have provided to our Minister of Māori Health. And now, um, although we have land claims, we're also reflecting on the loss of this economic base and how that relates to water, um, how land relates to the provision of housing to look after our well-being. Um, and so it's all very much interconnected. We also make reference to our military veterans who um, within this colonial structures um, globally, although they have dedicated their lives to support our country, they come back with very uh, under-resourced uh, services to support their, their health. And, um, and then when they retire, uh, there is not much to support their ongoing health needs, which is significant given their experiences in war. Now my talk will digress into the different um, aspects of um, how our Māori epistemology or mat, what we call mātauranga Māori is completely in line with holistic well-being. The Māori, mātauranga Māori, it is the epistemology for Māori knowledge, the ways of knowing and being in te ao Māori or the Māori world. It fundamentally describes whanaungatanga or interrelation of all living things with the environment in a state of balance. It encompasses a full spectrum of Māori knowledge, including the protection or preservation of natural resources, such as land, forests and water, food planting and gathering, protocols for carrying out these kinds of activities, including ceremonial practices or other rituals. Now, of particular note for mana, it is a multi-faceted multi concept which describes a prestige or power either inherited or acquired of an individual or group of people. I note mana with particular importance in this as it facilitates the ongoing reciprocity of hospitality within relationships as a fundamental priority to communication. And if we think about it, when, when that, that trust or um, communication is disrupted, um, compensatory actions can be taken to restore that mana. And I... Um, We'll talk later about uh, how, how in some, in a lot of ways, mana has actually been replaced with money and it completely sidelines the building of relationships and trust. Um, spirituality is an intrinsic component of indigenous epistemologies and for Māori, wairua, or in some circumstances being connected to oneself or one's spirituality, reflects the notion that any physical being has a spiritual element and as a key element to traditional Māori processes and rituals, as well as connections to people, both past, present and future. 
Similarly, Modi is considered as the life force of a person, object or collective, whereby the Modi of a collective group of people is highly valued and is integral to a well-functioning system. And our key assimilation strategy of colonization was the prohibition of Matauranga experts or what we call tuhunga and the systemic extirpation of te reo, the Māori language, which led to a loss of the cultural practices and traditions that have maintained Māori societies for centuries prior to colonization. Now, through rigorous advocacy, Māori are actively revitalizing some of these aspects, such as te reo and tikanga, or our ways of protocols and, and doing things, as well as our māturanga and our tuhunga tonga, as well as food sovereignty, or con these concepts of self determination as enshrined within the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Pre-colonial Māori were extended in structure with komato or the grandparents or elders providing the leadership and decision-making regarding use of resources, rearing of children and leadership roles within the tribe. This extended structure permitted sharing of child rearing uh, activities which allowed the parents and particularly the woman the opportunity to participate in activities external to the family, such as leadership roles. In the Hefakatoki by the late Rose Pere, He Wahine, He Fenua, E Naro Ai Te Tangata depicts a notion that both woman and land provide nourishment to such a degree that without them, man would be lost. This Fakatoki also gives credence to the concept that Mātauranga Māori is viewed through people and resources as all encompassing and sustaining of life. Now, I'll just draw on this notion of the privilege of knowing. So Sedgwick's privilege of unknowing in theory 1988 provides a useful lens to examine the struggles of Māori living in post-colonial New Zealand. And it's important to stipulate that unknowing is not simply the opposite of knowing, but more so an active process of constructing knowledge by a dominant power in order to privilege and perpetuate a controlling narrative. And unknowing in the New Zealand context is instituted through the perpetuation of a colonial narrative of the indigenous peoples as impoverished and incompetent of high level thinking and social order. Unknowing in this regard ignores or fails to understand that traditional Māori knowledge systems and social structures that had maintained Māori for centuries prior to colonial settlement. At the most entrenched societal level, the colonial government unknows, unknows their own history to the extent that Māori are unable to be self-determining as a right enshrined when the, within the UN Declaration Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And a recent example of this is, uh, is when the New Zealand government's Ministry for Children was forced to apologize after an investigation found that its staff had been acting illegally when they attempted to remove a newborn baby from her 19-year-old mother under extreme duress. Although the entire ordeal was video recorded and made freely available online, both the chief executive of that ministry and the New Zealand prime minister, who was also the minister for child poverty, had continuously refused to view the footage. And such actions are positioned in a privilege of unknowing whereby the post-colonial government, government ignores or invalidates Māori values and social structures and affords itself the right to undertake actions that are immoral, unethical, and fundamentally breach the United Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In Siskin's uh, statement in 2004 that we're history's actors and you'll be left to study what we do presents us with a challenge which is further elaborated within this, with this talk. How do we act within our knowing and how do we intentionally construct our knowledge in order to support our people and specifically our Indigenous people to move forwards in a dignified yet very courageous way? And I will share this... Uh, quote here, which is uh, written by one of one of our tribal leaders. And it's like this tree here, you know, the roots of the trees are our values, the tree, the trunk of the tree, it's like the human relationships. And that's the mana to the coming together of people and values. Um, the mana whenua, or the fruits, are the economics, that's the economic system, and that grows out of those relationships, and it's nurtured by the roots or the values of the tree. And uh, his comments is that society seems to do it upside down. The economy is, is the thing that um, positions you at the top of the power, at the power heap. Um, 
So I'll leave that with you there. So capitalism is a force that transcends nations, ethics, politics, and an effort to increase power and profit. Enacted through methods of colonialization and particularly the doctrine of discovery, capitalism is the mainstream dominant force of the world represented by the structures and epistemologies that we participate in to support our existing societal privileges and freedoms. The global threat of climate change is directly associated with capitalism through the ongoing reliance on fossil fuels, as an example. Similarly, the ongoing demise of social conscience implies a relationship of structural violence through the forces of capitalism. Despite the increasing preponderance of detrimental societal forces, little has been done to associate human well being with capitalism. And Quijano describes a need for a decolonizing epistemology to allow peoples to enjoy the freedoms of exchanging culture and society at liberty, whilst also freeing peoples of discrimination, inequality, and exploitation. Uh, Maurice, Maurice, uh, sorry for interrupting. Uh, but uh, I would like to remind you that because of the time limit, uh, so we have three more minutes uh, for your presentation. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think that's great, actually. I might just... Uh, I'll skip that one. This one here. Um, so I belong to the Ngāpuhi tribe, the largest tribe in New Zealand, which has never ceded sovereignty within the New Zealand colonial settler government. And the issue of that settlement is a perennially contentious issue because New Zealand was founded on a fraudulent document called the Treaty of Waitangi, which extinguished the sovereign rights of Māori. Now, the treaty is not the same document um, that was translated from Te Tiriti, which was, has a different meaning. And... Uh, Unfortunately, as a, as a youth, as a, a teenager, I grew up um, knowing that the treaty was the only document, and it is only since I moved to Northland um, on my grandmother's ancestral side where this, this document, um, um, the original document was seen, um, that I actually understood this difference. And so annually there are continual or actually constantly there are continual uh, deliberations around how we will acknowledge this difference um and i think i will um probably leave it with that there because i think we might be out of time Maybe I should, I'll just finish off with this last, last slide here. Okay. Th thank you so much. Thank you, um, Maris. Yeah. This is very, you know, knowledgeable and also very interesting uh, presentation. And I think we still have more time uh, uh, to further discuss uh, the topic uh, in the Q&A uh, period. So now I would like to uh, invite our next presenter, uh, Brian uh, Magnes. Uh, and Dr. Brian uh, McInnes uh, is the Bascom Professor and Faculty Fellows for Nonprofit and Community Studies from the University of Wisconsin School of Human Ecology. And he is a professional educator dedicated to diversity, education, and organizational leadership. And uh, the topic is going to, uh, of his presentation, uh, she is going to share with us is traditional law and the Georgian Bay biosphere. So let's welcome uh, Professor Brian McInnes. Brian? Yes, hello, thank you. I'm just uh, testing out my camera and my audio. Is that coming through okay? Yes. Fantastic. And for the great, uh, finale piece here, or I guess beginning to the finale. I'm hoping that my PowerPoint presentation is also visible to everyone. Is that showing okay? Yes. yes. Perfect, Thank you. Please. Thank you so much for the confirmation. So um, welcome uh, to my, uh, you know, follow up talk here to the uh, first couple of presentations, which were wonderfully done. I'm hoping I can continue uh, some of that good energy and thought process forward. 
The topic that I have elected to speak about today is uh, traditional law and the Georgian Bay biosphere. Uh, alternatively, I may have wanted to call this presentation toward the seventh fire prophecy, uh, just because the first two presentations really inspired some strong thoughts about that. It's a traditional Ojibwe Anishinaabe prophecy from this part of the world that talks about the current time and struggles for Indigenous peoples, but also that great promise of unified and productive and healthy futures that are also there. So that was uh, something which was inspired by, and I think I can work that into the last couple slides of this. Uh, I wanted to note that, um, well, I am with the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I do have my school's logo in the bottom right-hand corner of this first slide. Uh, I am also a member of the Wasoxing First Nation. It's a Canadian Ojibwe First Nation community. And that's the framework principally by which I think I'm going to be speaking, uh, just simply because we are located in the Georgian Bay. Uh, we are where the biosphere is. We are part of the biosphere. And our, I guess, fulfillment of our, you know, indigenous purpose and values on the earth is to ensure that that you know, very beautiful and sacred landscape is looked after and cared for in the way that was intended. So um, I, I'll just begin with a traditional Ojibwe greeting. Um, I, I do speak uh, Eastern Ojibwe. It's a variant of the larger Ojibwe Moen, Anishinaabe Moen language, which is spoken um, all throughout the Great Lakes area of North America. And uh, our word, our greeting word is Bojo, which comes from uh, the name of our great cultural, uh, I guess you would just call it historic um, hero. Uh, his name was Wanabojo, one of the first beings to work on the earth and give name and purpose to everything. So when we say Buju, we recognize the uh, connection that we have to that very earliest time on the earth, but also to that very first uh, half man, half spirit being who walked on the earth and fulfilled his purpose uh, without question and with extraordinary determination and sometimes great humor. So I extend a warm buju to, uh, to each of you uh, on behalf of myself and uh, the Ojibwe people of uh, the part of the world where, where, I'm, where I am. Uh, I am by trade an educational anthropologist, uh, linguistic and cultural ethnographer, and I also have a great interest in history, but as someone who grew up in, you know, greater Georgian Bay region, uh, coming from the Ojibwe Nation and learning very much to appreciate um, what it meant, means to, to live, live on the land, appreciate the land, love the land, fight for the land um, with um, all of the skills and tools that you have at the present. Uh, this topic is very near and dear to my heart. So when presented with the opportunity to speak about it, it was uh, indeed a, a very, um, I guess, uh, honored undertaking uh, to do this. So I, as I go through this, I, I do have some pictures I elected. I, I had a lot of script, but I thought, this just might be, and I was also considering it a moment of levity, knowing that actually at this time of day where I'm at right now, I'm actually usually, I've gone to sleep, so <laughs> I figured this might help. Uh, so I put up here the uh, the name of, of the Georgian Bay Biosphere in our language, uh, Minidugami, which is, uh, Georgian Bay is actually part of Lake Huron, one of the, the Great Lakes, but in our language, and our cultural understanding, it is actually a separate and individual Great Lake, and it is the lake, the Great Lake of the Spirit. So it is the sacred Great Lake of all of them, of course, each with unique purpose on the earth, but that is the uh, the name of the place uh, where, where we are from and where uh, we try to do our work. Uh, it, it's an incredibly beautiful place, um, and in fact, it's, you know, one of UNESCO's uh, World Global Biospheres that's been recognized. I believe that was back in 2004 that that status was given, uh, roughly 250,000 hectares of land, and, you know, we have an extraordinary number of different wildlife flora and fauna throughout and different landforms, so uh, we feel very blessed uh, to be in this part of the world. And uh, I did put up a couple of those, um, you know, the black bear, uh, black bear populations, uh, definitely back on the rise. And I did put in the bottom right hand corner, a very rare and treasured species uh, to my people, the uh, Mississauga rattlesnake, the Jishigwe, Jishigwe, we call them. 
but they are, um, you know, great keepers of medicine. They live closest to the earth and um, know many, many things. So uh, two uh, very valued and noble parts of our local biosphere. I also want to just introduce the, the name that the Ojibwe people have for themselves, the uh, Nishinaabe, plural, the Nishinaabe. Uh, some of our relatives in the United States uh, will go by Anishinaabe or Anishinaabe, but just again, dialectical differences. It's uh, the same language and the same words. Uh, we do associate ourselves as part of a larger political confederacy um, that has been in existence for um, about a thousand years. And I, I always really like when you get to refer to it in those terms, it kind of, you know, smashes a lot of the North American colonial government precedents uh, when you're part of a thousand year old group and you're dealing with a group that's been incorporated for 50 years. Um, and this is one of them, the Three Fires Confederacy, uh, which is composed of the Ojibwe people, um, the Odawa people, and the, uh, the Bodewatomi people. I put up on the bottom right-hand corner a picture of my great-grandfather, Richard King. His Ojibwe name was Debasung, and he was from the Migazi Ododemon, the Eagle Clan. And he was a great singer, great ceremonialist, great traditionalist who um, very much believed in the culture and language and tradition as being a source of our strength going into the future and was also a great advocate, early advocate for Ojibwe and indigenous sovereignty in a time when the concept, uh, it was difficult to articulate that without finding yourself in a great degree of trouble. So uh, definitely one of uh, my great heroes. I also wanted to put up uh, just in the immediate area and territory where I live, uh, while in our immediate biosphere treaty area, we probably have about 21 different indigenous communities. I did want to put just my immediate neighbors up to the right from, you know, some Ojibwe, Potawatomi and Mohawk communities, but friends and neighbors who, uh, you know, we feel uh, great sovereignty with as we in great stride as we move forward and, you know, collaborating and, you know, realizing that as even different indigenous peoples, the things that are, you know, that unite us are, are far greater than the differences between us. So I just wanted to also acknowledge uh, the communities of Shawanaga, Magnetowan, um, Metabic, Wasoxing, uh, Wata, and uh, Henby Inlet, uh, Chickdagoning. I also put up here just a, an example of a map. And this also relates a little to my topic in the sense of, you know, as we're bringing back our ideas of traditional law and what it means to live on the earth in the ways that as uh, local indigenous peoples here, we were, you know, given stewardship and, and uh, instruction of how to do that. Uh, one of those things that, you know, we realized very importantly, as I think we've heard very strongly throughout the set of presentations, is the role and the place of language in that. And so too is bringing back the names of all of our traditional names for our communities and our sacred places, um, as well as the stories that go with those names. And that, that, you know, truly is one of those deep and enduring places and sources of sovereignty um, and traditional rights to occupy, to help steward, and to have that kind of permanent place and sense of inclusion on the land, um, at least as it is in this part of Canada. Um, I also wanted to uh, put up one of the uh, Shinguakons, one of the small white pines. That's uh, very characteristic of the place uh, where, where I grew up. My parents actually live right across the, uh, the bay from there. But it's just uh, in that beautiful place of wind and rock and land, um, you know, our trees take on that characteristic bend, but they do not break. A good metaphor for our people. So with reference to this presentation, I, I want to just to, you know, in terms of talking about traditional law and how it relates to land, I just wanted to put up a couple of different words. And one of those was, of course, um, this notion of tradition this notion of law and this notion of land. And just think about how some of the differences are between how, you know, of course, settler colonial governments might think about those things, but also how, you know, indigenous peoples, um, certainly, you know, peoples from, and I will go back to this slide just for one quick second, you know, may interpret some of those constructs. And one of the things that actually, as the, uh, you know, the last presenter was speaking and these notions of treaty relationships came up, and of course, because those very much impact, um, you know, everything uh, in contemporary context about the lands we can access, about the certain rights that we have there. 
uh, and, and how, of course, how those are interpreted and how those interpretations can be changed. But I just wanted to say how incredibly proud I am of the communities in the home region where I work in terms of treaty negotiations specifically and advocating for treaty equity. And you know, one of the things that we've been able to do within the last, uh, you know, actually very recent number of years is to impact the re-examination of some of those treaty terms. And this is the treaty set back in the 1850s, early 1850s, the Robinson-Huron Treaty that essentially, you know, gave away uh, an obnoxious amount of territory. Um, you know, lots of question about how that was done and, you know, relegated people to, well, for all intents and purposes, these very little minor blocks that you see on this map. Um, it did acknowledge that there would be some, you know, permanent and enduring and continuing indigenous or aboriginal title to fishing and hunting in the ceded territories. But of course, with the provision that the land isn't needed for mining or settler occupation or other things. And, you know, these days, uh, you know, what couldn't be given that kind of status. So um, definitely some very important work to continue to do in that regard. But one of the uh, the very recent victories, and, and each of these victories is very, very substantial, was basically to, you know, get within, you know, the colonizer courts, the understanding that, you know, the provincial and the federal governments within the, you know, greater territory of Canada have violated the terms of that treaty um, by, and it's a really interesting principle, when you take it back to 1850 and every enrolled member of every band in the treaty district was to receive an annual annuity of about $4 Canadian roughly each year. And that has continued to the present, but think of the dollar difference between 1850 to where we are right now in 2022. It's actually fairly substantial. And you think about all the years that has not been equalized or equitized, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, a lot of other systems do a better job of that. And that's a good precedent for us to think about. And, you know, I'm so pleased that the courts have actually recognized that as a very significant point of discrepancy. So small victories. Now, of course, the greater victory will be when the province actually agrees to pay for that, which I understand has now gone back to litigation in terms of, of that element. But just that small victory opens up all of the potential for thinking about what else has been interpreted or not lived up to in the way that it was originally intended to. And I think that that spirit of the treaty becomes as important as the words of the treaty. And, you know, I also think about language, how that was also said to be such an important piece and how we interpret things versus how colonizer and settler governments do. And, you know, when you think about the language that was being used with Indigenous nations at the time, principally leagues, uh, which is roughly about three miles, and you have the First Nations saying, oh, no, no, we negotiated these leagues and settler colonies are saying, no, we negotiated miles. That's a really big discrepancy right there. And I think it's really important that, you know, as Indigenous peoples, as First Nations peoples, and certainly I've seen that within the greater Georgian Bay territory, that standing up together, basically, you know, finding those points of common intersection and interest and supporting each other in pursuit of those has uh, truly been a great point of strength that is actually making a difference. So I'm excited to see what other questions uh, begin to be talked about and uncovered. Uh, so too is this notion of law and, and of course law uh, and laws, um, especially as they impact land, you know, and in the context of Canada or the United States, you know, the principle of land governance is, is regulated by so many different entities, so many different bodies. But I wanted to pause on some of those considerations because, you know, we could talk for four hours on that and, and just feel very actually quite sad and hopeless. But to kind of extend that a little bit to uh, another sense of law that has bearing on land. And I'll just leave these in the background. I just think they were a couple things that were solicited from some speakers at some very recent, you know, treaty uh, conversations with members from different communities and I think very powerful words and those kinds of testimonies that our communities also give us are, are, are quite strong. So just wanted to encourage that. But at this notion of, of law, of thinking about traditional law and what traditional law means, it's, it's been a really powerful moment, I would say, for you know, Ojibwe peoples to consider what is traditional law, what is the source of that law, how, does, how has that always given us strength and guidance, and how will that continue to do so into the future? 
And one of those things that we've had opportunity to do as we thought of more defining what is traditional law and its source is, is really more strongly empower our own identities and revive many of those things that colonial governments sought to destroy. Uh, the entire world saw you know, the news reports from Canada this last summer as so many of our I know great uncle, great uncles, great great uncles, great aunts, great great aunts, and grandparents. Um, you know their their bodies were exhumed from cemeteries and residential schools all across this country. You know thousands of indigenous children in graveyards at their schools. I mean the travesty of that um, just is one I think manifestation of that larger effort to eradicate indigenous peoples either directly or through their languages and cultures, and this interest in developing a stronger sense of traditional law. Basically reminding ourselves, I, I heard one elder when I asked uh, how he would say that in Ojibwe, he was very quiet and he just said, you know, and, and that if I was to translate that would just mean, you know, the reason why it was that we were placed and lowered to this part of the earth, the reason for that. And in that uh, we were able to find some I get future directions as to how we could understand our role in the world based on some traditional law principles. Some things that that involved um, us doing was returning back and re-empowering the place of our traditional teaching structures, our teaching lodges. And uh, the one image I have in the one corner is one of those places. And, you know, again, finding a stronger place for our elders to speak from. Uh, another really important means of re-empowering our traditional structures uh, to be able to apply tenets of traditional law has been our clan governance system. And in our cultural traditions, uh, you inherit your clan uh, based on a patrilineal descent. Um, but uh, each uh, family, each clan family you're born into has certain rules, certain responsibilities, certain gifts. Uh, and, and together, we provide a great balance to how we govern, how we live, how we help each other, how we move through the world. And re-empowering the intersection of those clan governance systems, I think has very much been part and parcel to our reenactment of traditional law and how, again, that impacts how we do things on the day-to-day, -day, including our governance. And a third component, and this is taken uh, from um, a nearby rock painting. And our region is uh, rich in many petroglyphs, many rock paintings. Um, in some of the cases, these are, you know, absolutely thousands of years old. And they tell us stories. They remind us of the presence of certain spirit entities in the world and their role in creation and how those help balance the place of human beings. And returning to our original systems of reading and writing, meaning what stories do these pictographs tell us, has also been a strong part. So going back to the earth, finding the messages that were left for us from a very, very long time ago and realizing their application in the present and into the future. Um, so a few things here, um, thinking uh, of ourselves and remembering our identities as Anishinaabe people, um, the word actually, when we break that down in our language, it refers to, um, it actually can have two interesting meanings. One is a good being, um, Anishinaabe. And that's a nice way to be able to think about yourself and be able to look for that goodness in other people's. There's also a, a notion in the word, as you might understand it, ne, nisha, nabe, a being that was so created and lowered from the sky to the earth. So how our name describes also our creation, our positionality, and our place here on this land, on Turtle Island. And of course, as we know as indigenous peoples, where we are is where we are. We came from no other place. And there's something very powerful in our origin that way. And we have yet seen no other convincing evidence elsewise. Lots of theories, but we know what our stories tell us. We know what our law tells us. And our creation to be here, to steward, and to protect the earth and the waters and the other living beings in this part of the world. Uh, that's all tied into our creation story. 
it also becomes part of a sacred covenant with creation to uh, to remember our place and to live in a good way. And I, I've also heard some words spoken here. Uh, they resonated. They made me think of um, the words of a really wonderful uh, Lakota psychologist, uh, Dr. Martin Brokenleg, when he would talk about Indigenous uh, life and Indigenous rights and Indigenous well-being. And he would talk about that in the context of you know, making medicine and making something that brings healing and life and well-being to the people. And I remember him saying at one conference, you can only make medicine where you are. And I think we've heard that, you know, resonate very powerfully across the words already spoken this evening, that centrality and that importance of place and our connection to it, to our rivers, to our mountains, to, um, you know, the place where our ancestors are buried from whence our children's uh, faces emerge from the earth, that those sacred covenants that we have are also a great source of, of our rights and of our sacred laws. And... Uh, the piece that I, I think I was most especially inspired about by listening to the other speakers and thinking of the, the particular topic here related to this notion of prophecy and uh, the people, the Ojibwe Anishinaabe people from the part of the world where I come from um, have a prophecy. It's called the Seven Fires Prophecy, and it was told to our people uh, well over a thousand years ago when we knew our nation still lived on the east coast of North America. And we're given a revelation uh, by, you know, the spirit, by creation, that it was time to move and to go to a new homeland on the continent. And a certain, uh, like a sacred shell rose out of the water. And I just put a, one image there um, of one of the, the mega shells that rose up from the sea and um, promised to appear seven times along that journey that took actually hundreds of years to make. And in the prophecy, as these prophets came from the water, stood and spoke to the people and talked about each of these epochs or uh, I guess moments in time that the people would encounter, all of the wonderful things that they would experience, but also all of the challenges. And part of that prophecy in the most remarkable way and this was also documented in some of our birch bark writings, our teaching scrolls, uh, in our migration story, we call them, talked about the arrival of new peoples to this part of the world. And that must have been just the most extraordinary and bizarre concept to the people at that time. But having great faith and having great belief in their place in creation and their covenant with creation to do what it was the spirit directed and asked them to do, uh, they listened to those words, they took in those words, and they believed those words. And as, you know, the many hundreds of years that the nation moved across, you know, the continent to find its home all around the Great Lakes, which is presently where the Ojibwe Anishinaabe people live, they realized that in each of those fires, each of those fires which span generations, all of the things that were prophesied came to be. All of those things that took us right where we are in the present day. And I just wanted to say for those of you who are interested in learning more about that prophecy, uh, there is a, a book which is uh, probably very readily available done by um, uh, Edward Benton Benet. He was uh, one of my mentors, one of my great teachers, and uh, did a lot of amazing recounting of Ojibwe Anishinaabe oral history in the Mishomis book, uh, which has some very powerful teaching stories and uh, it's a great source of strength and resilience and knowledge and would recommend that to anyone. But in that book, he, he talked about uh, this particular right. problem. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry for interrupting. Uh, um, because of the limit of time, can you uh, try to uh, finish it in maybe uh, five minutes? Oh, I was planning on having it done in like two and a half. Okay, that's great. That's oh. great. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So oh, I will let you finish. I will let you finish. Then we can go to the uh, QA period. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Sounds sounds good. And uh, I might have just lost a few things. Um, just wanted to double check. Is my presentation back up? Okay. I'm assuming that everyone can see this. So I, I have something up. I just called it the Seven Fires Prophecy. And essentially what this time said is that in this time, and this is part again of our sacred law, our connection with each other, our connection with the land, that a new people would emerge on the earth, that they would you know, move 
they would move differently than other fires, other epochs had before them, they would have to. But in, in that this time, unlike the other times, at least not to this extent, that they would actually have to pause, they would have to look down, and they would have to retrace their steps and find various things left beside the trail. And what was very poignantly said about that time is they would have to seek out elders and they would have to find out things that, you know, um, were never taught to them uh, because many elders had fallen asleep or those words had been stolen or those ideas had been forbidden and that they would have to be careful in how they did things. And they were said, this will not be easy, but this will be necessary. And it was said that as the people of the seventh fire would walk their road, and would see great challenges come to their nation, that there would be in their walk a rebirth of their past into the future, and that they would learn to live on the earth with the other peoples who had come to share their homelands, and that they would find as they moved over this metaphorical trail that I have here to the very end point where there is a seventh fire, which is where we are right now, that they would stand at the top of that place and they would look forward into the future. And ahead of them, they would see two pathways. Now, one of those pathways led to a road that would, was beautiful and green and lush and offered the promise of peace uh, between peoples. The other road was, was said to be um, better, better um, established, but yet in many parts was black and charred. And it was said that if the people chose the correct road, that the seventh fire would light the eighth and the final fire, which was one of peace and love and understanding and fellowship between all peoples on the earth. It was a path to sustainability. However, if the other choice was made, then the path would lead us to a place from whence there would be no return and all of the peoples of the world would suffer. So in a good way, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the, um, the role of prophecy, the seventh fire, and just to say that, as one of our elders often said, is this the time of the seventh fire? And rhetorically answered, indeed it is. So I look forward to these conversations and how all of our stories can help contribute to this time for the betterment of the future. Miigwech and thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, it's really a touching ending for your uh, pre presentation. Thank you so much. So now we will come to uh, the uh, section for uh, Q&A. So I see uh, there is a question from Guy for uh, Professor Guy Chilton uh, for uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Morris. So I, I also see that uh, Dr. Morris already gave some uh, response uh, in the chat box, but I would like to you know, repeat the question again, and maybe uh, Maurice, you can share your response to all our audience. So the question is, uh, could you explain this concept of annoying a bit more? Is it the deliberate attempt to destroy traditional law, or is it just a notion of setting it aside? That's the question for uh, Maurice. And I, I personally also have uh, some questions uh, for both uh, Marcel and uh, um, Sean, and also a question for Brian. So my question for uh, Marcel and Sean is that, uh, since you mentioned uh, the intellectual property right uh, as a way to protect, protect indigenous right, and uh, our experience in Taiwan is that, you know, the legalization or uh, the, the category uh, in the legal system, sometimes will just undermine the holist, ho holistic um, um, concept of indigenous knowledge. For example, um, the, the, some skill or, or some knowledge um, that might be um, so-called uh, tangible cultural heritage, or sometimes it's intangible, but there is a you know, a dichotomy or there is a category of tangible and intangible, intangible cultural heritage in Taiwan that sometimes lead to, you know, a very difficult situation for, for us to claim our uh, knowledge to be registered uh, or um, recognized as a cultural heritage. Uh, so I don't know, does that also happen in, in Australia or how do you deal with that? 
So that um, that's my question for Marcel and Sean. And my question for Brian is that you mentioned the treaty and the uh, victory you had recently. I, I, I really congratulate to that. Uh, but I, was, I also see the situation in Taiwan that we don't have treaty. There's no, no historical treaty in Australia too, right? So we try to uh, have the legalization process in Taiwan, try to have the government to recognize indigenous rights. And we did have some progress, like we had the indigenous basic, basic right uh, passed, enacted in, in the Congress. But we also see that uh, with the legalization doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, guarantee the realization of indigenous right. For example, sometimes the uh, administrative um, body will be very reluctant to the, to the realization of indigenous right, even though, even though they, there is a law passed in the Congress. So I don't know, does that also happen? And, and, and especially in, in, in your country and especially as an anthropologist, how, what, uh, what do you see or, or what's your opinion regarding to the legalization of indigenous right or the protection of indigenous knowledge? So we have three questions. Uh, one for um, uh, Maris, uh, one for Marcel and Sean and one for Brian. So maybe uh, Maris, you can uh, go first. Please. Kia ora, and thanks, Guy, for that um, question. So it was, uh, is unknowing, is it a deliberate attempt to destroy traditional law or, or is it just setting it aside? I think it, it, it could be, if you look at both of those points on a spectrum, um, it's the active process of constructing knowledge by the dominant power, um, privileging a controlling narrative. So in a, the example I've given is the Tohunga Suppression Act, which outlawed traditional Māori healers in the early 1900s from practicing, um, regardless of the type of practice. And uh, why they did that is that um, um, reportedly there were people um, doing chanting and uh, um, prayer. It's actually a type of healing in itself, and we, we recognize that. Um, but um, at the time, apparently there was a bunch of other people that were not so much doing that, but were doing some other kind of um, charade and um, making or well, ripping people off of it, if, if I can be so blunt. Um, so instead of, of um, being um, intentional about supporting the thing that did help health, they completely outlawed the whole thing. And that actually resulted in a lot of our traditional healers being either put into uh, incarceration or some were put into mental health facilities, um, which obviously has drastic implications on their families. And some of those families are here to tell their stories today. Um, so yeah, if that, if that uh, hopefully that answers your question, Guy. Um, would you like to follow up, Guy? Uh, actually, real quick, real quick, Mari, the is it when you say it's it's a, it's attempt to deconstruct that knowledge, um, it, it it's when that implies that there there is some it doesn't imply actually I, excuse me when when you say it it's a it's a li deliberate attempt to just sort of deconstruct or destroy it. The I guess what I pointed out in my question is that there were a lot of people at the time who were Maori who actually supported getting. I mean, there's that irony within the whole process, and maybe you could just speak to that real briefly. Um, yeah, no, I think I think that might be a by the aspect of lateral violence, and that uh, there were some Maori uh, that were recognised at the time, and um, a lot were getting. Uh, I guess you could say kickbacks for. Uh, and, and they were provided benefits um, for taking certain actions. Um, and, the, you know, the, there has been some of that echoed throughout the history on, on the downfall of that specific um, outlawing of that, of um, the tohunga. Um, and it's only more recently that we've uh, affirmed and recognised traditional Māori healing again. So it's like we've now, I guess we could say, re-known it. Um, 
we knowing it. So, uh, and yeah, the, the drastic fallout that, that, that is created is just horrendous. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks again, uh, Maurice. And uh, uh, Marcel and Sean would like to uh, uh, answer uh, the question and give us some of your uh, insight regarding to, you know, the legal, uh, will the legalization of indigenous uh, cultural heritage or, you know, the intellect intellectual property right will somehow uh, undermine uh, the holisticity of uh, indigenous knowledge? Um, I might, I might that sort of have a bit of a, a thing. I, I guess there's um, a couple of um, uh, possible lessons that sort of come out of any attempt to define stuff you know, in legislation or policy. And two really good examples in um, Australia are actually sort of creating policy around cultural burning um, in that process of creating um, a policy to support cultural burning in national parks and different areas. Um, it sort of, uh, I guess it sort of drives some change in what we actually do. And, uh, mm. It, it's sort of changing the, um, uh, I guess that sort of inherent nature of being emerged out of country and it sort of becomes about definitions. And probably the other, the more striking example in Australia is our native title legislation, which um, has, you know, almost sort of completely recreated what our culture is. And, uh, you know, in our attempt to prove our native title, we have to reconstruct our knowledge, you know, you know, completely Western frame, which, you know, we lose a lot of that, um, uh, uh, you know, cultural, um, uh, cultural detail and, and cultural importance that, um, uh, you know, is um, highly relevant to us in the community, but, you know, maybe not to a judge trying to make a decision whether we have maintained our, you know, traditional connection to country and some sort of, you know, Western view of what that actually is. Um, yes, uh, Marcel. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. Um, yeah, certainly, like some legal constructs, like talking about native title, like the High Court has actually said this requires translating. Well, it's a recognition that the Aboriginal relationship to land is primarily spiritual, but then they say to recognise native title, we have to translate the religious or the spiritual into the legal. So they're very different constructs of, of law in itself. Um, but getting back to the point you raised about um, intellectual property and, um, you know, whether the Western construct undermines the holistic um, way Indigenous peoples look at these things, I'd say absolutely yes, um, because, you know, well, the Western construct of intellectual property because it is, comes from international law as well, it's fairly... Um, consistent in you know having to have a material form having to show certain things um, so it is very much based on tangible things that can be demonstrated um, and in like Australian intellectual property law sort of the intangibles not really covered by that it may be it's in we have different state and territory cultural heritage laws and to my knowledge only one jurisdiction also recognises intangible aspects of culture as part of that um, and that sort of relating to cultural landscapes and stories about country and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's sort of more seen as cultural heritage than intellectual property in that sense in the Australian context um, when we start talking about in intangible um, things, but certainly the work that's been done by Indigenous scholars around what is our um, cultural property and intellectual property always emphasise the need for um, protection of intang the intangible as well. So it sort of very much demonstrates the difference between the, the different concepts of law and culture, um, I think. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Marcel. I have a uh... Uh, 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 of question, additional question, uh, which is relevant to the first one. I would like to uh, throw in uh, first, uh, then I will invite Brian to answer the question earlier and we'll come back later, okay? 
uh, but I will let you know my question uh, in the uh, uh, now that um, uh, Guy, Professor Guy Chowden and I have been discussing that, yes, there is a, a, a philosophy or a logic behind the modern uh, law. Uh, so that the confrontation of the traditional law, uh, indigenous traditional law and the modern state law will very, very often lead to uh, the undermining of the uh, philosophy or logic of traditional law of indigenous people. But is this possible or is there some you know, positive, positive case that indigenous, the, the philosophy of or, or the logic of indigenous uh, traditional law can also kind of change the logic or, 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 or modifies the logic or the philosophy of a modern state law? Is there any possible or is there any you know, positive case that I would like to you know, uh, learn from you? But I will come back later, so we can have uh, Brian uh, to answer the question first. Brian, please. Sure, I'm happy to offer a couple of thoughts, and I'm most welcome any additional con, uh, you know, any additional thoughts or contributions from anybody else here, because this is a pretty wise group with a lot of different perspectives. Um, from to answer your question quite simply, I. I would say yes. I would say yes because we have to. And I would say yes because that's actually been a pretty powerful model that many of our ancestors have helped establish for us to follow. I mean, I'm always inspired by the two row wampum that was done by the Haudenosaunee peoples that just, you know, showed the, the two paths, the two canoe paths of each of the you know, the colonizer nation, but their own nation is, you know, moving along side by side, different streams not interfering with each other's journeys. And, you know, that was a, an article which was created very early um, as sort of their own negotiation, but it's also something which has become codified. And I think many current policies and structures. So I, I would say, you know, with that, uh, there's a couple maybe tenants that go there. Uh, it's, it's that hand in hand effort of using all of the tools that we have access to right now. And uh, it's one of the things I think Mr. Benton talks about in his book, The Michelmas Books, is, you know, use all the tools of the colonizer to basically achieve the things that your people need for the future, but also, you know, also re-empower, re-establish all of those things that you have and that you are. And those two things together, that can take anybody far. So that would be my answer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. And uh, Marcel? Sean, did you want to speak to that at all? Um, yeah, I, I just had sort of one, one kind of point was that um, uh, if you're sort of looking for that um, uh, equity in philosophy, I guess the, the first thing that sort of need, needs to be dealt with is sort of the imbalance that exists because of, you know, continued colonialism in uh, mm. uh, lots of different areas. And uh, for us here in Australia, colonialism is still very active and something that we deal with both in the law society and academia and uh, um, a lot of my time is spent flagging uh, the impacts of colonialism in you know aboriginal land management and sort of cultural practice and um, yeah. all that and uh, I think um, uh, you know equity in understandings of the world is um uh, you know, is a, a great outcome and something that we need. But, um, you know, colonialism's nature is to, you know, suppress those things. So, you know, and when everything in your culture, like, you know, our Western culture here in Australia is built on those ideas of colonialism, I, you know, it's, it's a very, it's something that operates at the very um, sort of, you know, base of, um society here so you know um it's a there there is a lot of recognition of it in australia and um you know a lot of goodwill but undermining it um you know and 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 that is hard and i guess the best thing that aboriginal people or indigenous people can do is sort of act with some level of insurgency in academia and law and society to you know um to uh uh, bring on a paradigm shift, but yeah, that's yeah. about the best I can sort of think. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I was thinking along similar lines. I think, yeah, can 
um, traditional laws uh, modify the logic of modern law? I think yes, and I think it has to. I mean, the the problems that we're facing as a, you know humanity today, I think require that paradigm shift. Otherwise, like what's happening is it's just not sustainable. And um, I think yeah, elders, uh, you know standing up and, and speaking out against that because it's necessary for the survival of the species and the planet and you know it's the survival of life as we know it today and I think you know just picking up on some of the things that Brian said too that notion of you know the seventh epoch where those different knowledge systems are shared and come together to to find the right path forward I think it's very much um, where we're at today in in terms of our future. Yeah, thank so. you, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I would also like to, you know, um, respond to uh, Maurice a little, um, because, you know, um, the issue of health or, uh, you know, medical care uh, is especially important uh, for uh, indigenous people because it's related to our body, our mind, and our connection to the community and our connection to the land. But it's also especially difficult for indigenous people to, to you know, claim our knowledge and try to uh, challenge the modern uh, scientific knowledge because uh, the medical science and the boundary it built up like you need to have the license you issued by the government so that you can be a, a medical doctor. So it's a very strong, there, there's a very strong barrier, you know, protecting the modern uh, medical, you know, knowledge, the, the system. So I, I, I really admire the, the work you have been doing. And also for every, every of our panelists today, your work are, are, are very, you know, inspiring to me and I also, I, I believe they are also very inspiring to all our participants. So we are closing to uh, the end of our uh, discussion today. But before I close uh, the discussion, I would like to invite all our panelists to give your uh, final remark for uh, your presentation and also uh, for our discussion today. Okay, so I, I'm go uh, with the order uh, in the beginning. So I would like to invite uh, Sean and Marcel for uh, your final uh, remark, then uh, Marcis and then Brian. So uh, Sean, please. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, probably as a, a final um, sort of thing to say, um, in in my sort of work and my talk and that, I, I um, sort of have been seeking that recognition for the the ways that um, Aboriginal people sort of think about things, particularly like cultural burning in this instance. And uh, in sort of, um, you know, the, the community, I guess, are calling for uh, greater protection, which I think really equates to greater involvement and protection of rights to engage in these cultural activities. I think that sort of... Um, uh, what's um you know at the heart of it but um protection of the knowledge is also very important um to communities but as i sort of try to to make um make sort of the point that it's a cultural practice and um aboriginal people having the right to practice that culture you know on country such as um you know national parks and other protected areas and that is a way of protecting that knowledge as well um inherent in Aboriginal people actually being able to do the practice. Thank you so much, Sean. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I just think like the legal paradigms have to shift in terms of accommodating greater respect for Indigenous knowledges um, because what's been happening to date is, is not sustainable in terms of um, you know, the health of the planet and, you know, it's sort of something Brian sort of mentioned talking about thousand year old traditions, um, well, we're talking 46,000 years in Australia compared to what's happened to our country over the last 230 years. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's just, just a small time, but there's been so much destruction. And I think, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, First Peoples in our country are certainly working to try and turn that around into build that dialogue to try and shift some of the paradigms around 
um, protecting country and looking after country. Thank you so much, Marcel. And uh, Maris, please. Um, I'll just share uh, some last reflections, I guess. Um, and it was probably the end of my talk, so I'm just going to edit it in here. Um, so we all started life with a first breath, a first heartbeat in the same basic physiological and, and anatomical provisions that underpin this existence that we call life, within which we create experience and meaning. What does economic development do for the drunkard, the homeless, the marginalized and the discriminated if our social structures ignore or alienate these mortal beings at the basic level of human interaction? How do we reconstruct a social reality where agency is privileged over capitalism and where we defy unintended consequences that will otherwise allow many of our brothers and sisters to slide into darkness? And I'll reflect on uh, the great Bob Marley in whose words in the, the redemption song, emancipate yourself from mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our minds. So we are the beholders and bearers of knowledge, experience and potential. So how do we defy oppression, either overt or covertly arranged? And how do we construct and experience indigenous freedoms that any human being could and should enjoy? And I didn't mean to end with a bit of a, uh, a puzzle, but I guess just trying to incite some thinking of, of how do we continue to stand up and um, claim what is rightfully ours. Thank you so much. Um, Brian? In closing, I would just like to say one of the things that I didn't have an opportunity to underscore uh, enough when I was just going through my slides earlier, but one of the things that has actually made our efforts that much stronger has been our intentional um, reconnection with our land and our life-based activities. Uh, you know, it's not like a lot of those things were completely foreign to us. Many of us grew up doing many of those things. But, you know, of course, as participation in, you know, Western-based societies has increased, uh, you know, we found ourselves not doing the things that, you know, we were originally gifted with the task of doing on the earth to the extent that we, we could. And that reconnection and that, you know, reteaching of those things or teaching of those things to our young people and being able to just sort of feel the strength of the land that has only strengthened our resolve to protect it. So that would just be just my humble suggestion that there's great healing, great strength, great life there. And that is a gift we all have. Uh, thank you, Miigwech. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to once again, thanks to all our participants uh, for being here today and also uh, our uh, panelists for sharing us so um, important information and, and, and your knowledge, your studies. As a member of indigenous people in Taiwan and also a faculty in the university, I admire the work you, you've been doing and I learned a lot from your, your sharings. I would like to once again, thank to uh, Professor Guy Chowden for initiating uh, this wonderful uh, um, uh, se uh, season and wonderful se uh, webinar series. So, uh, Thanks again, and uh, it's time to close uh, our discussion. Uh, and I would like to, you know, uh, hand it over to um, Mehdi. Maybe you would like to make some announcements of our next season and also uh, about the digital certificate that some people will be interested in. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Daya. I want to echo your sentiments to thank our speakers, panelists, um, and you as our moderator for an invigorating first session. Um, thank you, everyone, for sharing your expertise and knowledge with all of us. Also, a big thank you to our attendees here on Zoom and also on Facebook who are watching at the Engaged Scholarship in the Asia Pacific page um, for your participation and support of this webinar series. We do have three more sessions in the symposium. Our next session will be titled Resource Management Across T Traditional Lands and Waters. That's going to be next week. If you're in Los Angeles, it's Wednesday, March 2nd at 6 p.m. If you're in Sydney, Thursday, March 3rd at 1 p.m. And if you're in Taipei, 10 a.m. March 3rd. Uh, the registration link on Zoom is in the chat box for you to access, but you can also find it on our main Facebook page and our main uh, 
uh, engaged uh, research um, website. Um, we also do have a certificate if you're interested. The link is available in the chat box um, and you can access it there. We'll also drop it in Facebook for any of our watchers there. And once again, thank you everyone. Take care and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.